This is Mission Control in Maryland, the heart of the New Horizons mission, which thrilled the world in 2015 when it flew past Pluto, revealing a strange world of water ice mountains and nitrogen glaciers. In a few short hours, Mission Control will be alive again as New Horizons flies past Ultima Thule, the most distant world ever to be visited by a spacecraft. Never before has a spacecraft been sent to a target that wasn't known when the spacecraft was launched. To see this primordial object, which has been there since the dawn of the solar system, what a historic moment. Welcome to the sky at night in a ringside seat at the edge of the solar system. It's New Year's Eve here at Mission Control in Maryland. There's a party atmosphere. People are excited, but not about 2019. Just after midnight, the New Horizons probe will make history in the outer solar system. We're a matter of hours away from the flyby, and here at Mission Control, you can feel the excitement and the tension rising. New Horizons is on its way to an encounter with a small icy rock known to the catalog as 2014 MU69, but to the team, it's Ultima Thule, an ancient name for a place beyond the edge of the known world. It's further away and it's fainter than Pluto. And so this is truly a voyage into the unknown. We have a pretty good idea of its size. It's about 20 miles across. This is a lot harder exploration, much tougher flyby than the flyby of Pluto. And it's much quicker because it's so much smaller, we don't see it until we're almost on top of it. We really don't know very much and that, of course, is part of what's so exciting. A critical part of the preparation has been the search for debris around Ultima Thule. With New Horizons moving at an incredible 14 kilometers a second, even a collision with the tiniest object could have catastrophic consequences. Something the size of a pea could hit a fragile component of the spacecraft and basically render the entire spacecraft inoperative. Something that small could do Absolutely. That. At that kind of a speed, it's way faster than a bullet. And as a result, you could literally lose the spacecraft at flyby. And because most of the data will be on the spacecraft and coming down much later, we lose almost everything if we don't get, uh, if we don't get the data down from the spacecraft. So what have you found? Nothing. And, uh, <laughs> I've never seen a scientist so happy to have found nothing. It, but uh, there's always the possibility of just that one little pea-sized object is in the wrong place at the wrong time. And uh, so even though the risk, we think, we assess it to be very low, there's always the possibility of something going wrong. And I got to tell you, it'll, it'll feel really bad, uh, not just for me, but for everybody. It's now a waiting game not least for principal investigator Alan Stern, who first dreamt of this mission decades ago. So, Alan, we're here because New Horizons has always had the mission to explore the whole Kuiper Belt. Why? Why is this part of the solar system interesting? Uh, it's interesting scientifically because it's so well preserved uh, from the origin of the solar system, and that's because it's far from the sun, and therefore it's not heated. It's almost absolute zero, and that acts to preserve things. And what are the challenges of getting a spacecraft out there and keeping it working when you do something as complex as this flyby? Well, there are real challenges. This is a lot harder exploration, much tougher flyby than the flyby of Pluto. We're farther from the sun, and that means the lighting levels are lower. And we're farther from the Earth, and so the communications times are longer. The spacecraft is older, so the onboard nuclear power supply produces less power. So we have to be more careful about power management. And then on top of all that, Ultima, is 100 times smaller than Pluto and 10,000 times fainter, and so much harder to track and hunt down. How have preparations compared this time to approaching Pluto? They've been very similar. We have made very careful plans and tested them in, in detail. Uh, we've searched for hazards as we did at Pluto. We've had the same team training and mission simulations that we had at Pluto, so we're not cutting any corners at all. It's just as rigorous a planning. 
to most people watching, New Horizons was the Pluto mission. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, is that how it feels to you? Um, I think that for the public, this is likely to be sort of an encore, uh, sort of a dessert course, if you will. Uh, but for us, you know, we designed the spacecraft to do this from the start, uh, to work in the lower lighting levels and to, to have the power to go on, the communications range to go on. We put enough fuel on board to be able to do the Kuiper Belt part of the mission. So this was in our plans from the, the very beginning. Even though it is risky and it does have its challenges, um, it is within the envelope of what we designed it to be able to do. But one of the unique aspects is that you hadn't discovered the thing you're flying past when you set off on this journey. Um, and, and that proved more difficult than you expected. Yeah, it, this is a first. Never before has a spacecraft been sent to a target that wasn't known when the spacecraft was launched. It was more difficult to actually find a target, in part because we discovered that the Kuiper Belt has less small objects the size of Ultima than was originally thought. So they're fewer and farther between. And we had to hunt a lot harder to find one that we could reach with our available fuel supply. You must be very proud. I'm very proud. Well, I wish you luck on this latest adventure. We'll Thank see you, Chris. you on the other side. Yes, definitely. Good luck. In a matter of minutes, New Horizons will fly past Ultima Thule. No spacecraft has ever encountered an object this far from home. And it could unlock the secrets of how the solar system formed. When I was a little girl, this was the solar system. The sun in the centre. Then Mercury, Venus, Earth and Mars. Moving further out, you got to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus and Neptune. And of course, in those days, little Pluto was still a planet. And this was it. But more recently, we realised that this is a tiny part of the complete picture. It was long suspected that a larger body existed beyond Neptune. But it was only in 1992 that the Kuiper Belt's existence was finally confirmed. And dear old Pluto was found to be its largest member. The appearance of the belt is that of a large primordial debris field encircling our solar system on the same flat plane as our planets. And it was to here that NASA dispatched New Horizons. This is a model of the spacecraft. Now, the first thing to notice is that there are no solar panels. That's because it sits so far away from the sun that solar panels don't work. Instead, it has a radioactive power supply. The real thing is about the size of a baby grand piano and has seven instruments on board. Each one has a vital role to play in the mission, especially during the flybys. The New Horizons science payload consists of three optical instruments, two plasma instruments, a dust sensor and a radio science receiver radiometer. They were designed to investigate the geology, the surface composition, the atmosphere and the temperature of Pluto and its moons. There's this same suite of instruments that will explore Ultima Thule. In Maryland, the new year has arrived. But for eager partygoers, it's the New Horizons flyby of Ultima Thule at 33 minutes past midnight that they're waiting for. Everyone cheering knows that the flyby has happened. Curly, how do you and the team feel? We're excited, we're getting closer. Um, obviously, New Horizons is, but we still don't know where the spacecraft is staying for that. We'll have to wait until tomorrow morning. So, excited for the data, but still a little bit nervous until we know that spacecraft's safe. If the spacecraft has survived, it'll have visited the most primitive object ever explored, completing the first reconnaissance of the solar system's last frontier the Kuiper Belt. Ultima Thule is one of billions, if not trillions of objects that make up the Kuiper Belt. It's known as a trans-Neptunian object, or a TNA to its friends, a minor planet that orbits out beyond the gravitational reach of Neptune. Scientists suspect that within the Kuiper Belt, there may be clusters of these minor planets and other objects, which have been left untouched since our solar system formed. 
To learn more about them, I'm meeting Michelle Bannister. These are tiny little icy worlds, some of them the size of a city, some the size of an island, some the size of a continent, that orbit right out in the outer solar system, well outside the orbit of Neptune. And there are hundreds of thousands of these little worlds. So how do we see them at the moment? We see them as unresolved points of light. We can't actually make out their shape. So here's an image from the Canada-France Hawaii telescope. Inside this little blue circle is the dot of light reflected from this world at the edge of our solar system. So last time you came to talk to us, you were just getting data from the Outer Solar System's Origin Survey, and you were getting the initial results. So what have they shown and what further results have you got? Our primary goal was to understand how Neptune migrated. It would have scattered the many millions, even billions, in fact, trillions of tiny little worlds that were in the disk of building blocks of planets, the planetesimals. And where they currently orbit tells us about how Neptune migrated from closer to the sun to its present day position and shaped the early solar system. Okay, so, um, so what is the survey telling you? We can see with unprecedented precision that there is structure within the round and flat orbits of the Kuiper Belt. So they're very much in the plane of the solar system and they're quite confined in the orbital space they occupy. And this is a population we've been referring to as the kernel for its population density. Maybe what we're seeing here in orbits is a little backwash from Neptune moving around in the late stages of its migration. So clustering of those objects into that sort of, into that orbit? Yeah, it's an over-density in this region. Right. And New Horizons is flying right to one of these little kernel worlds. <laughs> so what do you think New Horizons is going to discover by actually going to one of these sort of kernel bodies? Well, this is great because New Horizons is exploring a world that is smaller than what we can explore from here on the ground. So from the Earth, as astronomers, we can study a population. We can understand how these uh, worlds orbit in space. We can see the overall structure of them. New Horizons gives us an individual world. As a geologist, this is what we call ground truth. This is finally getting up close and seeing the details that we can only see in low resolution, but for a whole population. What sort of detail will it tell us and what will that indicate about these populations? I'll be really interested to see what the carbon-rich materials are that's on the surface of this and how it relates to the colours that we observe of this particular population of kernel worlds. And I'll also be really interested to see if this is a binary. Oh, so wh why is that significant? If it's binary, that will tell us uh, potentially about how planetesimal formation works, how little worlds collapse out of the initial disk of gas and dust in the solar system, how they condense into these worlds, and then how they're shaped and evolved over time through collisions. <laughs> Are you hoping for a binary? I am hoping for a binary. <laughs> <laughs> well, I do hope that New Horizons discovers a binary and sheds light into some of your research and gives you a better understanding of what's going on out there. I'll be delighted to see what they find. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's New Year's Day back in Maryland. If all went well last night, New Horizons should have completed its flyby of Ultima Thule and sent a message of triumph back home. But we haven't heard the signal yet. We're watching the team at Mission Control and they look pretty calm. Calmer than I feel, anyway. It's looking good. Here we go. Everything's good. New Horizons is going to spend the next two years talking to us, telling us about this fascinating object. I think people are quite happy. New Horizons has survived its Ultima Thule encounter. And while the science team wait for the first images to beam home, I want to take a look at the best picture we have so far. Just before the flyby, New Horizons took one final snapshot, and here is that shot. Now, I know it doesn't look like much, but until now, this object's just been a single point of light, and here we can see it's an extended object, maybe a bit like a 10-pin bowling uh, pin or something like that. Large lump down here and a small lump up here. One of the big questions, then, is whether this is one object or two objects in tight orbit around each other. 
We do know that it's rotating. The team can see that it's moving in this direction, and it goes around either every 15 hours or every 30 hours. We don't know which yet. And the next question will be looking at the surface of the object. When we get those close-up images from the flyby, this is just the beginning, and the answers are coming. Imaging a Kuiper Belt object is one of the most challenging tasks any amateur astronomer can undertake. Generally speaking, it's easier to see Kuiper Belt objects when they pass closer to us, and examples of such objects would be Kuiper Belt comets. Incidentally, there is, as we're filming this, a naked eye bright comet in the sky. That's Comet 46P Wurtanen. And by the time this program airs, Wurtanen will be in the constellation of Lynx moving northward into Ursa Major. While 46P Wurtanen heralds not from the Kuiper Belt, but the closer asteroid belt, it's a great way of getting your eye in for future outer solar system comets. And it is a truly striking specimen. Now, in terms of amateur observing of Kuiper Belt objects, Pluto is a classic example. But at magnitude 14, it's actually quite a dim object. And at the moment, it's not particularly well placed. It's best seen during the summer months. So I've selected an alternative, an even dimmer object, which is Eris. Eris is a trans-Neptunian dwarf planet, and its discovery in 2006 famously triggered the debate that saw Pluto's planetary status downgraded. Now, observing Eris is not for the faint-hearted. To stand a chance of grabbing it at all, you'll need good equipment, dedication and clear, dark skies. But if you do manage to grab it, then there's a real sense of achievement. At the moment, Eris is in Cetus, and at magnitude plus 18.8 is really pretty faint. That's about two billion times fainter than the planet Venus. The classic way of finding faint objects like Pluto and Eris is to use the blink comparison technique. Basically, over the course of several days, the objects will move against the background star field. So if you take a photograph on one night and then wait several days, take another photograph, if you take both of those images, line up the stars and then flick between them, the object should become noticeable because of its positional change between both images. Now I'm going to try and get some shots of Eris over the next few nights. But if you manage to get any results, we'd love to see them. So send them up to our Flickr page. Now, it won't be the ringside seat that New Horizons gets, but at least it will be your very own shot of a Kuiper Belt object. Back in America, everyone is on tenterhooks as we wait for our first proper look at Ultima Thule. Well, that image is so 2018. <laughs> <laughs> And there it is, Ultima Thule in all its glory, the most distant object we've ever explored. It's a triumph of space exploration. You might not be able to tell from the hubbub behind me, but the press conference finished a while ago, and everyone's just hanging out, trying to answer the questions raised by this new image of Ultima Thule. How did the two halves come together? Why are those balls spherical? Good science always produces more questions, but to get some answers, I'm going to go and find an expert. On the way out, we bump into an old friend. Brian, it's good to see you. I'm amazing here. to see you, Chris. Wasn't that fun? What an amazing day. What a historic moment. Yeah, I mean, I think further than anyone's expectations could possibly have taken us. And so many questions just from that one image. Amazing. And there's more to come, so much more to come, yeah. But to see this primordial object, you know, this virgin bilobial object which has been there since the dawn of the solar system, untouched, is just the most thrilling thing, isn't it? Yeah. It's what everyone kind of could have dreamed of if they dared. And more to come. So much more to come, yeah. I want to stay here forever. Time to catch up with Carly Howitt to see exactly what New Horizons has found. Well, Carly, we are sitting here with these amazing images. What do you see when you look at Ultima Thule now? Um, other than a lot of work ahead. 
<laughs> well, that's yeah. exciting. Well, so we get it. We're, we're there, right? So we have ourselves a ball game. This is uh, an amazing observation. It, it was right in the center of the frame. It was one pixel off of where we expected it wow. to be, which is incredible when you think about the way in which this flyby went down. So uh, we have uh, an object that's it's clearly two lobes. We have, uh, it looks a bit like a snowman. Yeah, so it's, it's, it's lodged in my head as a snowman, I think. It definitely. is, so uh, a smaller lobe and then a sort of a bigger lobe on top, which uh, the object itself we nicknamed Ultima Thule. And so um, because scientists aren't very, you know, <laughs> good at making up new names, the, the bottom lobe, the bigger one is now Ultima and the top one's Thule. OK, that's not confusing at all. But the point is, so th th this is one of the questions coming in, was whether it was going to be one object or two objects in orbit around each other. We've exactly. ended up with something in between here. I think we've ended up, well, we've en clearly ended up with a single object. It's not a binary system. It's um, joined they're, together. They're joined together um, at the neck of the snowman. Um, and they, they probably were two objects at one point, though. So we're looking at a snapshot in history where they are one object. But if we'd gone back a few billion years, we might have seen them circling around each other, coming together very slowly to um, make a single object. Um, so you said very slowly mm -hmm. there. How do we know that they came together slowly? Because they're very low density objects. So if they came together fast, they would just bounce off of each other. So you could think of this as sort of more of a, we've used the term docking, you know, things coming together and sort of sticking together. If, it, if they came together hard, they would have just either destroyed each other or, or gone off in their separate So do we directions. know what sort of, when you say slowly, do we have any idea what sort of speed? Miles per hour, like a miles, like walking pace, <laughs> like really very, very slowly. It's kind um, of fun to think of these things moving that slowly like and coming slowly together. slowly coming together. <laughs> yeah. So they've come together presumably a long time ago. We think so. So we think that this is a primordial object. So it formed at the beginning of our solar system, so four billion years ago. And so it's made up of whatever it was, was hanging around in that part of the solar system then. And it probably hasn't changed, which makes it so exciting because everything else in our solar system we've ever seen has been processed in one way or another. And so... By coming close to the sun exactly. or by collisions or something like or, that. Yeah, or, you know, erosion or all those other processes that go on. So this is a, really a first glimpse at what an early planetesimal, so the things that make up planets, would have looked like. If you take each lobe on its own, they're roughly spherical. That must be telling you something about those processes. Yeah, so the first thing I thought when I saw them was how lumpy that was. But this is the first time we've really seen the product of accretion, this idea that things slowly come together and, and they make something. And, and if you have things coming from all directions, you would end up with something that's roughly spherical. But to actually see it is kind of a, it means that the models were probably So right. the lumpiness is sort of, you could see on the edge here, right? Yeah, that's exactly. That's not the cut, a cut off on the picture, that's no, real. No, that's exactly right. So you can sort of see, and when, and when you, as we get more and more high spatial resolutions, we'll really be able to see the lumpiness. Yeah, we've got these new but images But you can see from the, right, from the edge that it's, this isn't a nice sphere, or in the same way that um, we think of, like, if you look at the outline of the moon, that's kind of very nice. And I guess that's it. telling you that gravity isn't, quite, this isn't massive enough for gravity to be all in Important, uh, yeah. Absolutely. I mean, this is a very low gravity object. I mean, if you were standing on it and jumped, you would <laughs> you would leave it quite easily. So um, it's not strong enough that gravity to sort of pull everything in and make a nice regular sphere shape. Well, this is the first image we saw, but of course, everyone wanted to see the thing in colour. Who doesn't like colour? You're right. So we um, from Hubble, we had an idea that it was probably red, but it's just a, just from this point of light. That absolutely, you see in Hubble. yeah. And to be honest, I mean, it's a very difficult observation to make from the Earth. That's why we went to Ultima Thule. So uh, the Hubble um, observations were consistent with red, but they're also consistent with neutral. And so we think that objects in Ultima Thule's class would be red, but we didn't know that for sure until we went there. And now. We have colour. So this is three different images that have been put together to make an enhanced colour image. That so this isn't how it would look to your eye. If you were able to survive sitting on a spacecraft in the cold depths of space for that long and you saw Ultima Thule with your eyes, this isn't quite how it would look. But what we've done is stretched it so that uh, we can kind of see a little bit into the near infrared. Right, so to the eye it would appear sort of dark. It would reddish. be very, very dark. So think potting soil, sort oh, of a okay. slightly dark red potting soil. OK, yeah. but if you turn up the contrast, you get this, this Yes, this absolutely, red yeah. So we're seeing now for the first time that Ultima Thule is red, um, and that was a really big result. But also something that comes across immediately in the colour is that the Ultima and Thule <laughs> are both red. And so that points to the idea that they have this common origin. All right, so why is it mostly red? Things in the outer solar system do go red. It's not necessarily unexpected that it'll go red. So if you have any form of exotic ice, and by that I really mean methane, um, and you subject it to forms of radiation, so that could be um, high energy electrons, protons, ions. Which come uh, from the sun, I guess. Which come from the sun, but also cosmic rays. 
cosmic yeah, rays are a big source, exactly, are a big source out there. Because you're a long way from the sun, and the sun's influence is so much lower than, say, the Earth. So if I took a fresh slab of methane ice mm -hmm. and I left it out in the edge of the solar system for a few billion years, yep. you think it would get red? Absolutely, yeah. Because of the formation of these particles? Because that's what happens, yeah. That's just by okay. processing. But the neck, I guess, the join between the two, that looks slightly different in these images. It's definitely less red. So we think that that's basically a point at which small particles, if they were to roll, they would end up there, right? You could think of um, putting something on either of these two lobes and it would roll, roll to the neck. Yeah. And so what we're seeing there may be just smaller sized particles and that would make it look brighter. What about these other bright patches? Do we know what they are? We don't really know at this point. So on approach that the sun's right behind us, it makes it nice because it's all illuminated, but it means that you don't see any shadows. Oh, like looking at the full moon. If you look at the full moon through a telescope, you don't really see much, exactly. many features because there are no shadows. So what we need to do is really, in order to know what's going on on this surface, what the topography is of the surface, we need to get the sun slightly off to the side and then we start seeing shadowing. And from that, we can get an idea of whether we're looking at craters, whether we're looking at something else. I mean, we, we don't really know what those are until we see that. This is why this is exciting because we get these images we can speculate about them, but the data that you need is already obtained. It's not launch another mission, it's listen to New Horizons as it's, it talks It's to just us. be patient. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that, that is difficult. It is. <laughs> so what have you been most surprised by so far? For me, it was the quick nature of this flyby. So I work Pluto as well, and Pluto was sort of a slow burn, right? You know, we started getting images and it's started to get more and more in our field of view. This object is so, so small. It was, it was a small point of light and then it was a bowling pin kind of, and then all of a sudden, boom, it's, it's here and, and we've got it. And so I think it's to see it just go so fast from really nothing to, to this has just been phenomenal. But um, I think understanding that next structure and, and the lumpiness that we were talking about is going to be keeping the people that model accretion busy for yeah, a long if time. We're trying to understand, <laughs> if we're trying to understand how things assemble, mm, this looks like two things that have got sort of got caught in the act, yeah, which is really absolutely. interesting. I mean, Christmas was, you know, was technically for most people on the 25th of December, but I think mine came a bit later this year. <laughs> well, congratulations. Thanks for talking to us and good luck with the rest of the work. Thank you. It'll take over a year for the full data set to be broadcast home. But already, this flyby is having a big impact. Missions like New Horizons are radically changing our understanding of the solar system, providing new science and new data that is ultimately allowing us to question our very place in the universe. It's just a textbook operation. It couldn't have worked out better. Everybody on the entire project is just ecstatic right now, over the moon. We couldn't do this without each other, so incredibly proud. Ultima Thule is a fascinating place, and we've already got enough data to know that it'll be keeping scientists busy for years to come. As for New Horizons, it's off out deeper into the Kuiper Belt, Already millions of kilometers past Ultima, continuing its historic voyage into the unknown. Next month, we'll be tackling a heated debate that has divided the scientific community. Just how fast is the universe expanding? Until then, good night. The Sky at Night Book of the Moon, a guide to our closest neighbour, is available now. And on Tuesday, the 20th century's groundbreaking scientists, who will be the greatest icon. You decide on BBC Two.